Governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai, believes that low UTME cutoff mark makes northern youth lazy. And on the latest on the field in Oshun State, Rahuf Aregweshola is asked not to disturb Governor Boega Oyetola of Oshun State. This is Plus Politics. I am Coyote Ladeng. Welcome and let's get the discussion going. Governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai, has stated that the low cutoff marks needed for admission into northern universities via the Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination, UTME, was making the youth of the region lazy. He stated that despite the educational benefits accorded to them by the Nigerian government, the region has the highest number of out-of-school children. He added that the varying cut of marks for different states is dividing the nation. And joining us to discuss this, we have um, Dr. Tunji Adigbeson, who is the CEO of Gidi Mobile. Good evening, Dr. Tunji. Good evening. Pleasure to be here. And also joining in this conversation, we have... Uh, Professor Adebayo Kolawale of the Federal University of Agriculture, Abel Kuta. Good evening, Prof. Good evening, Kayagi. Good to be on. Yeah, let, let, okay, I don't know. Let me not do by way of first mention. Let me start with Prof this time around. Okay, let's look at uh, what led to this idea of uh, educational disadvantaged states being given low cut of mark. And I recall that this was a burning issue while I was in the university. And I felt this is not true until I get to hear from some of my friends who came from the north that sometimes they don't need up to 100 to get admitted. What's the history behind this, if you can help us? Okay, I think the whole thing started after the Nigerian Civil War. Uh, it was realized that the civil service and many of the professional associations are filled by, uh, by Southerners. And three policies were brought up to try to bring the North to speed in terms of the opportunities available within the Federation. Uh, the first one is the federal character policy, uh, which tended to say that for every available position, uh, the different sections of the uh, Federation should be represented. So if you are appointing two people, you should take one from the north, one from the south. If you are taking six people, you should take one from each of the geo, uh, geopolitical zones of the country. So that policy came into being. The second policy is the quota system, which says that each regions of the country would have a certain quota in certain federal appointments and placement in, uh, in institutions. And it's not just universities. It's also uh, federal government colleges uh, and, and special schools. So the concept of educationally disadvantaged states is then to identify some states who are always less represented in educational opportunities. So if you say, let us admit everybody by merit, certain states in the country will not have any candidate. So they then said, okay, if your state belongs to this category, then you will have a different cutoff mark, be it in the UTME or in the admission uh, uh, examinations into uh, unity schools and federal government colleges. So these are started since uh, the early uh, 1970s and up to today, these are, these are in the laws okay. of the Federation. And so if uh, somebody from <clears throat> any of the Northern states wants to come to the Federal University of Agriculture in Abel, that uh, under the ages of educationally disadvantaged states, uh, they would have a higher opportunity. The amendment to that is that we set cut-off mark. So if our cut-off mark is 180, if somebody from Ogun uh, scores 230, that person from Ogun may not get admission if the quota allocated to Ogun 
is already completed. Whereas the educationally disadvantaged person may score exactly 180 and still be offered admission because the quota for that particular state has not been filled. Okay. So it's I, only I, I in think the you've done justice to that, that background, Prof. Prof, I, I think you've done justice to that. I'm sorry uh, we, we do not intend to cut you abruptly. We will come back to this discussion. But let me listen to Dr. Tunji. Now, the worry now is the intention is to make sure that we have some kind of um, powers between the north and the south. And from what Governor Erufai just said, he, he did say that... Uh, the out-of-school children are still in their huge numbers from the north. So where did we miss it? Okay, so I think that um, <clears throat> there's a problem with diagnosis. It's not just to know a problem. You need to diagnose it accurately in order to solve it. I want to enter the area of, let's say, the cause and saying youth are lazy. I'm a young person myself, and I think it's always dangerous to assume or say or claim youth are lazy. But the problem here is out-of-school children are primary and secondary school age. So um, a matriculation measure is not really going to do that much on a primary school situation. So if the di diagnosis is that not enough people have access to opportunity versus not enough people have the required achievement level to enter. These are two separate problems. That, oh, in this place, not enough people are learning well enough, or in this place, not enough people have access. There are two separate problems. If it is an access issue, then you can do ranking placement allocation. But if it's an achievement issue, then you have to improve the quality of the, the, the teaching. You allocate more resources. You, send, you do more things to make more people have um, higher achievement rate. So there's a diagnosis issue is the problem about access to the opportunity for schooling, meaning we have enough educational achievement, but we don't have enough school. Or the problem is we have low achieve, educational achievement rates in primary and secondary. Then the solution will be fix that. The second issue is we conflate affirmative action with these two things. So affirmative action, placement, education, and achievement. So one thing is affirmative action. Like if you apply to work for Google or Facebook and they say they are giving preference to women, they say, okay, for a product manager has to have capability A. Among all those who have capability A, if there's a woman, we will take her. But they're not going to shift on that cap capability A. So it's when you do affirmative action without retaining achievement requirement, hmm. then it just becomes... And this is education we're talking about. So you can have good intentions if you don't diagnose well, if you don't implement it well, you'll have a race to the bottom and you'll be asking yourself, how wow. did we get here? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let me go back to Prof. Now, he has mentioned something very important that uh, whatever the good intention is, if the diagnosis is wrong, then it can be definitely be counterproductive. Let's look at the impact of what has been happening. Apart from out of school children, what has been the impact in terms of the kind of people that we have in authorities and uh, in terms of the depth of their intellectual capacity? Prof. I, I think that in fairness to uh, Governor Rufai, his argument has been wholesome with regards to education in the law. Uh, so his reference to out-of-school children, I think is taken in context of the fact that a general understanding that even if you perform low, you would get admission, keeps people to say, oh, I don't care. What then end up happening is they tend to drop out of school and not return to school. Mm. So, but beyond that, what we then have is that when people get admission to universities uh, without the merit necessary to make it there, they then tend to graduate uh, with a less... With, with a quality that is less than optimal. And I think that is the argument that uh, Doc has been trying to make, that it is not good for the system to throw away merit on the author of affirmative action. Affirmative action says that you meet the merit and then we will give you opportunities. Hmm. So uh, in terms of people leading the country, I think 
the um, the educational prowess of leaders from several parts of the country that have benefited from um, educationally disadvantaged opportunity uh, would also be a pointer to the fact that we have done a disservice to our nation. I think there are a few Northerners that I know that are really good and would have uh, attained what they attained by Mary. And you will see the distinction uh, between these people and those who rely on their quota uh, or the educational disadvantaged status to rise to power. That is never good under any circumstances. Also, that is never good under any circumstance. Doctor, let, let's also uh, do this diagnosis now and uh, find mm -hmm. a way of how we can uh, uh, come back to the round table or, 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 or to look at how we can get it right. As we speak, we've had situations where there's been, there's been regular constitution review and this is not one of those things that are considered to be reviewed. Let's uh, thank God for the background Prof gave us that we'll, we looked at what happened at the Civil War and we want everybody to you know, catch up. But as we speak, how do we you know, move forward or retrace our steps? We need to, so I'm going to separate the general political issue and the education issue, right? If you look at um, most countries, developed ones, what is, the, what do governments do? Okay, we provide security and a framework for our people. But what we invest in is our human being, more than road. Education, healthcare. These are the things that we need to be investing in because human beings solve the other problems. If you invest in human beings, they'll solve. Where am I leading to? I believe we urgently, this has been said, not, I'm not the first to say it, many people have been saying it over the years, but I'm yet to see it happen. We need to declare a state of emergency in education in Nigeria. And not just declare it, follow through with some urgent work. The reason I say that is because educational achievement is in crisis across the board. One, one, one manifestation is that we're so focused on exams, 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 placement, placement. What of, as Prof was just saying, the merit level for your level. So let's say at the primary school level, what are the educational objectives for all these children and what percentage are hitting it? At the secondary school level, what are the educational objectives? What percentage are hitting it? I have a preference for the WASP exam, the West Africa School SK exam over the JAMB exam. But we are all focused on JAMB because we are focused on placement. But the certification that says across these three years, six years, these nine subjects, this is your educational achievement level, which we should be tracking, which for the nation was 72.5% failure, grew to 665 but still more than half of all our children passing through secondary school are not hitting the required minimum achievement level. So regardless of the entry into university, there's already a problem on ground. So I think we need a holistic approach. A, a, call it a state of emergencies, call it a robust national education now policy, like India just issued that's going to carry them for the next 50 years. Not the 15 page kind of issue we tend to do. Serious, robust national policy that looks at tertiary, secondary, primary, how they fit in, disadvantaged areas, affirmative action in the proper way, funding, the poor. The, the, we need some holistic work, not patch, patch, patch. And there's a slight problem because um, political tenures tend to be four years. And a lot of the, you need to put some work into this thing for a decade or two to transform the nation. We have 100 million children below the age of 18. That's our legacy. Okay. If you do not take this education thing seriously once and for all and figure it out, we have a crisis Dr. Tuchy, brewing. Let me quickly butt in here. Let, let me quickly jump in here. I, I, I want us to look at this template you keep referring to and look at it beyond the discourse that we're looking at. Now, this issue of affirmative action, all inclusiveness, we, we use it in the banking issue, we use it when it comes to the gender issue, and people will say, at what you know, oh. at what price are we going to look at this? People have said that, why shouldn't we have 35% of women in government? And uh, how do we ensure that this 35% are 
are eminently qualified. Let me stay with you, Doctor, and I'll go back to Prof. Yeah, so that is why I, we need, if you want to take it accurately, you look at achievement requirements. When, that's why I use the example of job, um, job applications. Right now, I'm trying to hire some people. What do we do? We do job description first. Before we advertise, we say, this person needs to know how to do A, B, C, D, E, F. So the requirements, the achievement requirement is the starting point before you do anything affirmative. So you now say, I'm looking for th at least 35% of women with that requirement. And then if by chance I couldn't find them, I go and do some background work, encourage more women to come, teach more women, but I don't shift the, the achievement benchmark. That's the thing that's okay. very important. So we need to be more conscious and more... We, you say, we need to believe in this education thing. Okay. Not just a paper. Not to just have it to get it. We need to believe okay, that Dr. we Tungi. really need I'll, I'll come back to you. And not toy with the achievement levels required. Set Beautiful. those benchmarks at primary. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to make sure that um, uh, we look at it holistically because the other side of the arguments are not part of this discussion. So, but thank God you are doing justice to represent their interests. So, Prof, how do we, you know, Look at this, you know, in terms of all inclusion so that one region does not become subservient, one region does not become, you know, drawing us backward, and we have meritocracy at the end of affairs. I think I totally agree with the uh, point that Dr. has made that merit first, then affirmative, affirmative action second, not the other way around. Uh, that's, that's, that's important. But how do we ensure all, uh, inclusiveness? I think the first thing is that if you are a an educationally disadvantaged state, the onus is on you to identify where the disadvantage is coming from, okay. not on drawing everyone else back. So, for instance, if we found, uh, find out that, okay, um, many children at, at, second, at primary school level don't go to secondary uh, to secondary school because they are forced to marry. That's 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 a critical problem that can be addressed at the level of educating the parents, at the level of making some kind of provisions for children from poor who may be forced into marriage to have scholarship to go to school. So it's not by bringing down the marriage, but by encouraging more people uh, with necessary incentive to be available within the opportunities available. Let, let's take another kind of disadvantage. In many of the Eastern states, you find out that you have many more females in school than male. So if you want to use affirmative action to get male children to go to school, you need to understand why male children are leaving school. So it, it needs to be a state-by-state -state affair. You look at your state. My state is educationally disadvantaged. Address the problem, not seek for a reduction in the uh, in the merit or a move a movement of the goal pole so that you your uh, your kids will be able to meet awesome awesome so I, i'm sure you're itching to say something because i'm looking at uh, doctor i'm looking at this debate on affirmative action it's, uh, uh, maybe for a moment let's go away from education now when it comes to politics for um, pushing you into political discourse. Mm -hmm. When it comes to politics, the women mm -hmm. felt we must be given a chance. And we asked, have you joined parties? Have you shown interest? Are you ready for some of these funny, funny criteria that politicians go through? How do we, even if you have the merit, but have you shown interest? So I think that, uh, <laughs> maybe we'll keep repeating, I like what Prof said. It's, it's related to what I said about diagnosis, right? I do believe that as a people, where one country, you know, Nigeria is a very one of the most diverse countries in the world, actually. And I believe that that diversity is a strength when you harness it well. When you don't harness it, it is a killer. But it's a thing that I really want, I believe all of us as a nation should move forward. So I think it is a good point if I look at my nation, and I see that some are moving well, others are not moving well. We, I say, sure. I say yes, it's in my interest because I'm a whole nation. These other ones that are not moving well, I think I need to do something about it. Or like you said in the politics, I look at this thing 
And I say that half of us are men, half of us are women. 99% of the people in this space are men. Are we putting our best feet forward? Is there a reason why they're not there? I won't even put the onus on them. I'm looking at it as a nation that I could feel that as a people, half of my best is not being made available. So then I'll do what Prof said. I'll now ask why. It is that why that we drive the action. So rather than saying to the women, oh yeah, women, have you tried, have you tried? If I truly believe that I'm losing something by women not being there, because it's possible I don't believe it, that's not me, but someone can actually believe, let them not be there. Well, that's that person's view. But if you truly believe we're losing something, then you now look into it and say, okay, maybe the time they do the meeting, women don't like it, or maybe the way they do the meeting, women don't like it, or maybe the meeting itself, women don't like it, then I may try to put some remedial or corrective action. Okay. So I feel that remedial, corrective, affirmative action must work on proper diagnosis. Oh, Otherwise, it's going to pervert the whole system. So definitely, we are a diverse world, we're diverse people, and if everybody in a place is of a type, and everybody in another place, there's a kind of distortion in representation. You have to question, Beautiful. is that intentional? Is it good? Is it bad? If for some reason you feel it is bad, then you have to do some more homework. Don't just rush to doing quota and allocation. Ask yourself, why? Is the why that should guide that action? So that personally, from the, let me say in terms of anecdotically, from what we've seen over the past few years, using the example very strong leaders, very innovative leaders, many people who have done a lot well in politics in the recent past are okay. women. So I think that common sense would say that probably is a good idea to have more. But before just starting to do allocation, my key question will be why are they not there? It is the answer to that question that should guide next Your steps. Action. I can't okay. start making any steps without I, having I think I think I, I totally get your points now and that of the prof. But, but Prof, let's let's look at the way forward because I don't want it to just sound academic. I don't want this discussion to just sound intellectual. Yeah. Let's go into our own affirmative action now. As we speak, there is a constitutional uh, amendment going on in the National Assembly, and uh, we are looking at how do we come out of this? How do we take this statement credited to the governor of um, Cardinal State more serious? Because I can imagine if, if your university, for example, now wants to say it is basically a merit, I'm sure the constitution will prevail over your action. So how do we treat the document first? I, I, I think there's an implementation error, not a documentation error. Interesting. I think the, the law was very clear. Is the people who are implementing it who mm. tended to thwart the implementation of the law. Because how? I know that in my university, irrespective of where you come from, you must have the minimum requirement. The advantage you have is that your state has got a quota for you if you meet that minimum requirement, which is the, that's the spirit of the law. Unfortunately, those who mm. implement it then tend to thwart it to say, let us bring down the gold pole. And I think that is the argument that the governor of Cardona State is making. That enough of this taking an advantage where there is none. Mm. It's not an advantage to bring somebody who cannot understand physics into a physics class. You are not doing that person any good. You are not doing the nation any good. So for people like him to come out, I think it's the first step. But we need more people like him. Unfortunately, we don't have them at the moment. So Governor Rufai is a is opening a door that I think that with time we would have more and more northerners, particularly in this instance, coming up to say, look, you are not doing us any favor by shifting the goalposts uh, closer to us. Let us be on the same merit level, but let us go back at home, look at our state budget, for instance, for education, and address the key problem, keeping our children from meeting the criteria that has been set, rather than shifting the criteria to suit our children. Prof, I, I, let me get your last comment and I'll allow doctor to also round off this particular conversation. Now, I understand that the, the, the negative impact of what we have in terms of implementation 
even runs into appointments, into offices. As we speak, if the way you get into university was so abysmally low and you become a graduate for whatever reasons, maybe with a low grade, for example, you have become a graduate and you are qualified to be appointed for a particular position. So it tells round us. So this is just beyond UTME, the immediate thing that we see. So how urgent should we look at this issue and give it a holistic treatment? I, I, I think at this stage, if we try to go political and say, abrogate um, quota system, abrogate educationally disadvantaged state, and uh, all of this, it will not fly. Because politics is negotiation, is uh, argument and so on. But what we can do is to call our attention to the ills that is being done to the system, which I think um, Governor Rufai is leading on. Mm -hmm. We need more voices along this line so that over time, we begin to see the futility in lowering the score for some states, rather than go head on and start another battle of some people who wanted uh, uh, all their people to dominate the affairs of the nation. So, a political, because it's already in our constitution, going ahead to say remove it is not likely going to fly at, at this moment. Okay. But engineering enough awareness to the ills that it is doing and the advantages that we will gain if we start on marriage first then concession later. Beautiful. Thank you. So, Doctor, do you also agree that this is a problem of implementation? And uh, what exactly is the issue in terms of, is it a letter of the law or the spirit of the law in terms of our constitution now? I totally agree. It's an implementation issue. There are definitely issues of equity in the country and there are issues of history. And we're a country where we have to think of ourselves as one country and we need to move the country forward. But how to do it is the problem. I, I feel two points I'll just make. The first point is, as a nation, Nigeria, let us start loving excellence, not a location sharing. Let us love excellence. Everybody be excellent. Then we have quota allocations among the excellence. It's what we were saying before, minimum achievement levels. First, it's not, that is what is missing in this affirmative action and discussion. If you have minimum achievement levels, excellence, meaning everybody we're discussing to start with is good enough, then as a public good, because we also have to distinguish between private goods and public goods. So if this is taxpayers' money, public resources, the public um, government can say, okay, I want to share my resources equitably. Another thing is a private good. If it's a private institution, a private house or private family, you can do it however you like. But if we start to love excellence and we start thinking of minimum achievement levels before affirmative action, allocations, and sharing. That's step one. The second thing is I really advocate for us to start measuring achievement levels at the primary, secondary, and uni and tertiary levels. Not exam scores. Not exam scores. Educational achievement levels. Because that's what's going to assist all the stakeholders to do the thing that Prof said. So just imagine there is a ra rating that okay. would say, okay, it could be an assessment exam. It could be something way of saying, okay, uh, by the end of primary six, have you achieved all what you are supposed to get? Then you say, ah, my percentage is currently 20%. My percentage is currently 80%. And I as a state, I as a private proprietor can now look on what work to do. At the secondary level, what kind of assessment system do we have for metric to say, okay, how good is this system? Then okay. for some maybe behind, some may be ahead, we now do palliative and remedial action. Same thing. So that's Quality discussion is missing. Quality excellence, minimum benchmark is what is missing. And from that point of view of implementing these issues, there are social and political okay. issues on ground. Let's just add okay. excellence into it. Beautiful. Because there are excellent people everywhere. And the people that you give who are not excellent is not good for their self-esteem. When you just dash somebody who doesn't benefit, exactly. who doesn't re um, marry Thank something, you so much. it's actually bad for that person self-esteem. But if you insist on excellence, you will Beautiful. find federal character in excellence. And then we'll be, able, we'll be okay with the federal character because all the characters will be excellent. 
But so, whether federal or state, thank you so much, Dr. Tunji Adigbeson, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Gidi Mobile and also an education enthusiast. Thank you, enthusiast. Uh, thank you for your intervention. And Prof, you always have you. Thank you for your intervention again this time around. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Okay, we'll take a short break. And when we return, we are going to discuss the field taking place in Ocean State. We'll be right back. <laughs>